They're cement pylons. They're at the front of the gate. So when the bus comes in, he doesn't hit the gate. I know exactly the ones you mean. It's a little pylon, right? It's a little small pylon. I slip off of this high fence and land straddled on the cement pylon and obliterated my nuts. This, like, one nut I can't even feel. It's pouring raining. I run across, it's Merrick Boulevard. I run across Merrick Boulevard. I pass out unconscious. These cats never even came to the yard that night. So I'm like doing all of this for night. It's unseasonably cold. It's raining. Now I I wake up from being unconscious and I got to walk a mile home and I can't even walk. Culture TV. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. Kill the color. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Kill the color podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller, live and direct, central London or central as you need to be, choose to be, want to be. You don't want to be anywhere else, trust me, it's bad for your health, not worth your time, and it's far too expensive. Um, big shout out to all the sharers and carers, people have been uh, spotting us from the jump from the very beginning, man, it's been such a long time and it's a pleasure to have you here. Our sponsors, the mighty GK Nifty Heads, have a massive 100,000 play to earn NFTs to give away to the streets. Just hit the link in the description or go to gkniftyheads.com and get ready for Hodder Wars Summer 2024. Um, We are going across the Atlantic into the Midwest where they serve it the best. Um, It's a windy time over there, but it's just heating up. We have a gentleman that has so much heritage and history in the game. And I'm not just talking about emceeing, influencing God knows how many people in a short space of time, but also graffiti artist, or should I say writing artist, a man that... uh, Pioneered the field of a, a backpack era with uh, Raucous Records uh, company Flow, but also goes under the guise of Loon TNS. He goes by the name of Big Just inside the place. How are you, my brother? Respect, respect. What's going on, man? How you feel? It's a pleasure to have you on, my brother. Honestly, okay. I, it's been a long search and I finally I struck gold, man. Even the conversation we just had before, it's just going to blow people's minds, man. Mm. I hope so. I hope so. We're trying to. <laughs> Where are you right now? You in the studio? Yeah, yeah. And uh, Just cranking and, out as as much stuff as possible during you know real interesting times. Yeah. How often? How often are you making tunes at the moment? How regular is your turnaround? Probably like five times a week. Wow. That's good. Two times. Yeah. Two times. Maybe mixing. Four or five times. It's, it's it's every day, but it's either if I'm making something or if I'm mixing something these days. So they alternate. You can't like make shit and make shit. Well, at least I can't. Not right now. No, there's got to be a there's got to be a sense of batting average, hasn't there? There's got to be a and exactly. also a motivation to really get get in there and get busy, right? Exactly. I feel like these days I can kind of anytime I step foot in the lab. I know I can make something classic. So I'm at that point. I'm at, I felt like, you know, I come up under Prince as well as I come up under hip hop or just New York club music in general. Like all three of those go at the same time. So I feel like, you know, Prince got a point where technically he had multiple styles of, of the way he liked the flow. Mm-hmm. And, you know, every time he got off, he got off with some dope. So I kind of feel like I'm at that point now. So I want to make as much stuff as possible because, yeah, the batting average is, is is getting there. It's getting up there. Sick. Um, you mentioned Prince there. And, you know, I think that it, to, to say his name, I mean, he should be a verb, really. Like, just the, the whole idea of the, it's that it's that sense of trust and um uh, fluidity. Yeah, fluidity of an artist like him. And there is a sweet spot within the generation of a, of a, of an artist like yourself, you know, you, you've honed your craft. So you, you're able to flow. Yeah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. He's the prime inspiration for that part of it. And then, you know, B-boy is, is the prime, you know, inspiration for the rest of it. B-boyism. On, on top of that, I came up in New York under, you know, even I've lived 
a gang of places now where I've come up in New York under the illest era of, of hip hop period. So the defining area, I was, era I was able to see it from, you know, from the beginning all the way up to now. So yeah, I was born into it. You know what I'm saying? It was the writing movement was, was already its first level of saturation before I even learned how to read. You know, in all actuality, that's kind of how I learned how to read certain things, kind of like a where's Waldo looking at the balls, mm. you know, and seeing the names. So that's kind of how, where it starts. So it was a real prime era to actually come up. And I'm, I'm proud to say that I was able to do that, you know, I was able to come up during those times. It really do mean a lot now, you know, especially since I have lived all over. But now you've got to the point where you're, and this is where this is where it gets interesting because the conversation that we had at the beginning, before we started recording, you understand, people, um, was one of that that dynamism that I feel um, artists of your era, artists of my era, I guess, to a, to a lesser extent, um, hip hop wasn't a spectator sport, and disciplines were one in the same, so far as. I guess it's the Bob Marley effect. If you can sing, you can talk, you can walk, you can dance, you know, right? So to have yeah. those, you, you, it's just a given that you do graffiti as well as emceeing and you can be a DJ and it's just all hands on deck, right? I don't know if I can say say it's like that. It's not quite like that. You still need some skills and ability for each discipline. So, you know, you just come up doing them all, I guess, in a sense. But there, you know, there was a point in time even when in terms of writing where the elements weren't combined like that, it was just done like that for, for the sake of documenting it. So it wasn't all of them together. You get together and everybody's breaking or writing or DJing, or it didn't really kind of flow that way. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a writing, there was a whole writing movement before there was a DJ movement. So right. to me, it's really writing you know, it was a whole thing within itself before we even got to the point where people were DJing and dancing at, you know, at the block parties or at the youth centers mm -hmm. or, you know, the project centers, either however, the parks, however it went down, you know, there was a writing culture, a whole entire culture before then that was already going through its first, second level of evolution. Before wow. we even got to the point where, you know, cats are coming together and everybody's look like they're doing everything at one time. Which, yeah, it was, it was just know, documented that way, wasn't it? It was just like, it kind of, you know, there, there was a point in time where everybody did hang out. You know, there was a point in time where, you know, where they say like Fab Five brought the, the whole scene downtown. And when it brought it downtown, a lot of people from different boroughs kind of converged on it. So there was a point in time where it really did feel like that. And that's another point where, you know, I, I'm happy to have been there when it was kind of new for everybody and everybody was like, ah, oh, this is fresh and exciting. You know, when futurism seemed today kind of seems prehistoric, you know, it really was on some futuristic shit at one point in time. Mm. So to me, that's what got documented. That makes sense. Yeah. I was a scene, that downtown scene where cast did come together and people were at the art galleries and People were in the fun house, you know, at that point in time when she was really cracking. Before yeah. the Roxy turned into 1018 and it was some other shit, you know, when they were close by one another and you could walk from one to the other. Man, that's a real scene that New York used to have, right? It's a great scene. It was a great scene. Yeah, it was, it was pretty dope. Mm. Um including the, you know, I almost, you know, right next to the fun house was, was these projects and they were at least 15 or 16 stories. And I'm standing like just a little you trying to get into the fun house because I knew one of the bouncers that he was from around my way. And I'm standing next to, he was like, you know, move, like stay over there. I'll get you in when I can get you in. And I'm standing there and someone threw like a frozen 40 ounce bottle and it shit landed like right next to me and it, it, it turned into powder. 
It was glass, oh. and it just turned into powder, and it just smushed in the ground to a fine layer, a fine powder of glass, basically. Right when I'm trying to get into this club where everybody is fresh and shit, you know, making some dancing, and, you know, there's writers in there, mm-hmm. you know, right at that point in time, so... Yeah, of course, of course. Um, let's stick with your age for the time. So, how old did you have been at that 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 period and point? Uh, well, in, in terms of what you call jumping off the porch, I kind of came up an orphan in a sense. So, I would say I jumped off the porch earlier than a lot of people due to the circumstances. So, I was trying to get into clubs 12, 13, 14, 15. You know, before, you know, I had a certain point in time on the streets and I got shipped off to like a military school. Wow. So I, I was there during a prime time. And even when they even got live or then, you know, my ass was in something similar to a prison until I was able to turn to legal age and get back out on the street. Wow. So I was there when it was sparking off, like really dope. And I was writing. Before, you know, like I said, I, I came up, I mean, writing was already crazy when I was three or four years old. It was already, uh, the, the single hits era had already been probably three or four or five years in. Yeah. From the 70s on, you know, you, you can count who and stuff like that, you know, in the 60s. But I'm talking about, you know, you looking at 72, 73, 74, 75. Early, early, I'm early. Like, I'm learning how to read and I'm learning how to read because I've seen commercials on TV for Lionel trains and we're, and we're driving through the Bronx and I see Lionel 168. Mm. Then there's Charmin toilet paper, you know, please don't squeeze the Charmin. And then I'm seeing Charmin 65. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking for these names and I'm like, and as a, just a youth, I'm not nowhere near writing at this point in time, but I'm like, Lionel 68, Charmin, Bug 170, Tree 170, 127. I'm like, Clancy 120, names that you're not even really hearing crazy cross. No, not at all. Name wow. Skylark, names that was really up at that point in time that, like, you know, deserve mention. But that's mm. like how I learned how to read. I'm just looking, I'm driving through. The Bronx or driving through Harlem or driving in Queens, just a little kid in the backseat of the car looking out the window like a dog, you know, and every borough has their own, you know, their own groups of writers, basically that, you know, that I, I know of just by us driving and going through. He worked for the transit authority. I sat on the bus with him while he ran and did his bus routes. Wow. So I, I before I even could pick up a pen, I knew Clyde was killing the buses. I knew Cat 87 was killing the buses. That's mm-hmm. because I could spell cat at that point in time. That says cat, C A T 87. I can understand that. I could start to understand the cursive writing. That says Clyde. Clyde is on every fucking bus imaginable. Mm-hmm. So I'm mm-hmm. seeing all of these things as a little kid. And that's, how I first started to get these names kind of like seared in my memory, basically. Then I started the writing and I started to catalog the names while I was doing it. So yeah, there's a lot there. There's a lot to unpack mm, for sure. in, in, in terms of, because it was more, you know, it was, my, it was my life at one point in time. It was my school. It was my curriculum. It's what I had to do to actually survive you know, survive as a human being, get some type of an education in me because I wasn't going to school and I wasn't going to school because she was not really cool and it was mm. fucked up. So in order not to look dysfunctional, I set off to do other things. I set off to write before I did anything. I set off to write because that shit was there first. And out of all of the things, you know, you pick up a pen, you learn, you know, you basically, you got to get your hand game on, basically. Mm. So it was a E, you can get your hand game on at 8, 9, 10, 11. You can work on it. By the time you get to 12, you could have a little bit of style. And that's basically what I did. By the time I got to 12, I you had the traps, a little, yeah. 
already had a little bit of style going on because uh, there was a whole generations, it felt like, of writing before me. So, you know, I came out in a, in a basically what they call the, you know, the saturation, the two letter throw up era. That's when I first started writing, but that was two. That was before. That was after the top to bottom, you know, masterpiece era, you know. And, and, and like I said, the single hits was before that. So by the time I fully, fully got into writing, I was in a whole other different evolution of it, basically. So I learned, you know, I, it was confusing because there was that was a saturation bomb. And instead of people using really dope names. Like people got up in in two letters, you know. So mm-hmm. there was a guy who wrote Hurst, you know, which was a super dope name. It's the name of like a hot rod shifter. Another thing that kind of comes from commercials. But he wrote O I. And it was Cat who wrote double O. You know, Cat wrote T O. And then, you know, it's is when N came about and N was the king of that shit. Bad N Kill Three was was murdering it during that point in time, you know, and that was just bombing. I didn't come about, I didn't like the bombing era. It's just when I first started writing because it was still that prevalent. I couldn't really stand a bombing era because it wasn't pretty no more. It wasn't like people really, it was about the saturation bombing. It wasn't about the masterpieces and doing shit with characters and had a little bit of style. You know, that era had came, the shit where, where Cliff did the piece of the thing the Marvel, you know, the Marvel hero mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to this day, the the white eyes and the black background and had white eyes and it looked, it just looked eerie and crazy as fuck when I first saw that as a child. You know, that shit was, mm. in, it was seared into my brain. So you'd see it go by on the train and you see them eyes, like the white eyes, man, that shit crazy. was crazy. Crazy. And so like you said, it leaves an imprint on on a young person's mind. Oh, super imprint. You know, then I come about in an era where everything is just all dogged out. But that's where basically I I have I've come to an age where I have to express myself now. Mm. I have to get past the point where there's like a a dysfunction and I have to turn a dysfunction into function. Yeah. Basically. So for me, the you know, even though he gets all the props in the world, Stay High 149, who also in turn wrote Voice of the Ghetto, the Voice of the Ghetto with the the double or the three, the three tone uni wise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We had three different <laughs> inks inside the uni wide. Yeah. Was the craziest shit ever on on the training was just a tag. It was so future at, at a point in time where everybody just had scribbles and he had, and he got up. So you're getting your little scribble in it and he's getting up in all the corner panels of the train, taking down the advertisements and just has this uh, dope square on each corner of the train. And he's getting up in voice of the ghetto in three color ink. Jeez. You know, that's so what I, I that's what that so ahead of his time. So that was before the two letter bombing era. So, you know, I'm, I'm fighting those two things. I'm fighting. I want to make two tone markers with, you know, wanting to get up and bomb at the same time. So the first thing I ever racked was I, I, I can even remember that. So I remember racking, a. Uh, Almost like a little short ink well, the little short fat ink wells for calligraphy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go only on. because I can rock it. I'm yeah, yeah. a little kid. Only because I can get it off. It's it's real short. You know what I'm saying? Just a little flat box and shit. So I grabbed that and I grabbed this uh, pint of paint that was was called silver burnish furniture. Like you, it's supposed to, I guess, rub it on. There's people, them old people who got the, the furniture, Leather. the ornate yeah, 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 wood yeah, yeah. on the sides and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I guess it rubs off. And so you get this so you can burnish it back in. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that shit was, stains forever, bro. Yeah, exactly. So so because of Voice to the Ghetto, the first thing I racked was a silver burnished ink thing in green calligraphy ink. And I made a homemade marker. And I thought about 
what stay high would do. I made half of the marker green and I made half of the marker silver. And that, wow, that's crazy. And, and because I did that, I didn't want to waste it and look toy. So it, it was so such an ill color combination. You had to you had to get up with style. Mm-hmm. So I had to like really put some style in it. And it and it worked. And it was because that, you know, I looked at innovation as the key to the whole thing right from the start, even though I was a little shorty. Even though the innovation for me wouldn't come until I got to the music era. I was still a student of the game, but I was learned you gotta you gotta be original in it. Yeah. I think uh, graffiti teaches you that it Makes teaches sense. you all the core principles of it teaches you about marketing style. It, it gives, it forces you to learn and educate yourself on the, the primaries of like what, what the scene's about. It, I mean, it, there's, there's so many layers to it and it, it, you've just got to invest. And by doing so, you know, you can ap- reapply those core principles to a lot of things, can't you? You really can. Yeah, you really can because it just shows that you're you, you developed a multidisciplinary lifestyle. Basically, you're able to do certain things, and if you're able to do certain things and combine and make whatever you do better, you can use it that way. Do people do it? I don't know. Not as much these days. It seems mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. It seems like everybody's kind of like one trick ponies. Yeah, but that's just not that's not just in one genre neither that's with a lot of things it's almost like get rich exactly exactly yeah they got it all they got it all backwards yeah they have they have they 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 they, they don't want to do the ten thousand hours exactly i mean um let's uh throw up some more names i want to know more names of the era bro get let's 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 hail them up let's send them up um um okay i gotta break it down into Basically, so the way I grew up, so I'm like an orphan. I'm from Manhattan. I was brought up by a school teacher who's from, who's originally from Brooklyn, lives in Queens, and her mom lives in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And so she was married to a transit worker who, who drove the buses and he was originally from Cuba. They weren't together no more. So he lived in Harlem. So I bounced back and forth a lot between all of them. So I bounced from having a nice house to going to her. The lady who adopted me, her mother lived in Boston Road and Boston and Gun Hill Road. Like her during the South Bronx era where wow. there's only two buildings on her block. The whole block was all burnt out. Wow. So as you see mythically, like on TV where it looks crazy and it's like, yeah. oh, there's nobody who could live there. Yeah, people, there's still people who live in there. So, like, she lived, there was only three people in a building that could have had 20 apartments. There's only three people left. And, you know, and this is where, you know, the lady who raised me, her mom lives. So, they would, wow. when they go, I spend weekends there. So, when I spend weekends there, there's a whole different group of names that's different than, than what's around me in Queens. So, El Marco, Kendo, Pearl, I, super cool 223. So even going back to the sweet dukes that, you know, made the ornate stuff with the clouds and the characters, mm-hmm. you know, lava. I thought Ted was a person. I thought Ted got up the most, but Ted was the Ebony Dukes. It was the first kind of gang, you know, where you all team up and write one thing. I thought it was Ted. Yo, I love like, that. Man, I love that stuff. Ted, Ted was up crazy, you know, and then you go into Manhattan and you go into Harlem or Uptown and SJK, Junior 161, mm. Top Cat, Coco, Cornell. Nobody, I don't hear nobody talking about Cornell, Casino, FDT, 56 Boys, Brooklyn, where the lady who adopted me, her family's from, App Superhog, who was a cat who wrote foot, F O O T E, with two eyeballs sticking out of the E. I don't, I don't never hear anybody talking about foot. Yo, that's crazy. Um, Dino Nod, Spin. Super strut. The first one I saw 
because of the, the way the A's and the D's and certain things ran out in Queens, that was the first top to bottom I saw was Super Strut. So I saw that before Stay High or Super Cool 223. Mm. And there was a cat who wrote Sweet Cruise or S Cruise. I don't hear nobody talk about S Cruise. Yeah, why don't people talk about these names? What is it? They just, uh, Is there some it's, fronting it's going on? The, when you, it's not even fronting. It's just, like I said, I came up a little bit different. It was school for me. A lot of these cats are older than me. They came up where they were really killing shit. Yeah, they were yeah, killing yeah. it to the point where it's really, why am I talking about them cats? Mm. It's really all about me. You know, rest in peace, Tracy. Yeah, Tracy can get up there and talk hours about the shit he was doing because he was really doing that. Mm. He was really there from the beginning to the point where he had all the gates on Smash. He had all the legal walls on Smash. All the legal fences. He had all them shits on Smash. Mm. So he was the first one I saw doing that before anybody was really doing that. He had that shit on Smash. Rest so he could do Tracy, that. Man. Rest in peace, Tracy. It's just a lot of cats, you know, really kind of weren't doing that at that point in time. So I still got to say that my most favorite writer is Faze. Mm. Faze, mm. too, because he's, he's the one I saw took the letter form from the beginning to as far as you can stretch it to the point where it's letters, but you can hardly even see it's letters. So he Amen. took it to postmodernism. I mean, he, he took it from his most simple form. So, you know, someone who really kind of invented and elevated the throw up from that point to beyond burner. Unsung hero. Um, actually, yeah. up here, uh, if uh, I'll, put, I'll point up here, this is this here is the phase two star writing from the underground book, uh, which takes pride and place on the top of uh, of the uh, podcast here. Um, and uh, awesome as, book. As, yeah, oh, brother, it's incredible, incredible. And um, and noted was your um tributes on the company flow fun crusher, uh, that's on the Loon TS, uh, motherfucking star master phase two. Exactly. I, I, yeah. Exactly. I felt like I had to get that out because at a certain point in time where, you know, you transfer over to music and some of these are just her names in your head, you know, you want to kind of preserve them and, and, you know, mm -hmm. give them time capsule almost. Yeah. Know. They're a time capsule. Like, as they say, give them their flowers. And you want to do that at some point in time where, you know, I'm talking to phase two, you know, I'm having conversations with them, not about graph, about other things, you know, but, you know, talking a mile a minute, you know, just talking about, you got to give him his flowers while he's still alive. 100%. You got to cover, you got to cover some of these names because that's, you know, as it was for me, where, you know, there was a point in time I was so hot because I wasn't going to school because I couldn't go to school. Mm. You know, writing was my school. It's a point in time I was so hot. I couldn't do nothing but memorize the names, the transit, the 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 truant authorities for school are after me because I'm not going to school. The child welfare services are after me because I'm basically placed in a home. Mm -hmm. You know, the the lady who took me in, we're fighting all the time. She's calling the cops. I'm like, I got cops called on me two or three times a week. Wow. Like my situation got to a point where I couldn't even write no more. All I could really do is memorize the names for the sake of not wanting to get caught and, and get sent to some type of a detention center because I wasn't I wasn't the biggest cat out there. I was a little kid. Mm. So I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to go to the... We heard what went on in Spofford. We heard, you know, we hear all of the horror stories. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go there. So there's a point in time I'm out on the streets sleeping on trains and I can't even write. All I can do is is think about writing or thinking about what I could possibly do at a point in time when I can get some ink and do it and plan it out well. Where you where you you basically, you know, I'm not, you know, there's a point in time where you know, I mean racking paint, that's obviously part of the thing. Well yeah, imagine yeah. if you got you gotta rack your your food every day. Mm -hmm. Every day you got to steal your food. It makes stealing crazy. It, like it, it just it makes the whole thing horrible because you you can't just I, I'm just gonna steal everything and moving. Mm 
Mm. Even though I'm from New York and shit is corrupt and basically that's what everybody was doing. In a sense, you know, it's a city of the get over. It doesn't mean that that's how you're supposed to live in life. No, no, you know what I'm saying? Not. Yeah. So, so the whole thing just got, got messed up and screwed around. And, you know, it was lucky at the point where it got at its worst. I got sent away, mm. you know, and in the next couple of years, kind of, you know, I guess like they say, you know, three hots and a cop, even though it's prison in a sense, you can thrive under a situation if you don't change from day to day. Mm. So writing, like I said, writing in general was a whole, I uh, had a whole other different slant to it. It yeah, wasn't definitely. exactly the same of everybody else. It wasn't just a cool fad for me. You know what? You know what really comes out in this conversation, which I, I mean, just going back to Loon TNS, the song "Company Flow," um, which I urge everybody. I know it's only recently considered, considering, you know, how long it wasn't. Uh, it's more recently been put on Spotify, but you know, this was a cult. This was a cult classic of an album. And um, you said something at the end of the song. You said, uh, you know. Um, if this doesn't make sense to you, obviously it wasn't made for you. So fuck you. That you kind of, I think it made half of my generation want to go back to the books and listen closely to what you say and just, you know, really get to grips with it. it this song doesn't do any, not even, a, doesn't even touch the surface in what you've just explained there. Um, mm. This is this, I mean, I guess a homage to the culture, but you, you were so in the trenches. It doesn't even seem, you could never, could you? Could you translate that into a song? How easy is that to translate into a song, Just y You can't. I tried a couple of times. You know, I got more than one writing song where I felt like I had to name certain people because I left certain people out. You know, I feel like I could make a song about fucking bombing, you know, or raid stories. Like, I, it, it, it does run deep because it just at some point in time when you, you know, when you do it, when you do it every single day for mm. years, basically. So you know, if you think you're fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, you're you're writing. So and you're you're seeing evolutionary shifts every single point in time along the way, mm -hmm. and then you're trying to make your own every single point in time along the way. Yeah. And uh, it's a it's a different, a whole other different animal, you know. And and where I was trying to do it, I. I was trying to turn dysfunction into function. Yeah. So I could never really get it all together. A lot of my shits came from mistakes just because I could only do but so much. I used to, the house I grew up in was uh, like a English tutor. It was like a stucco, wow. like a natural stucco. I used to take Lysol and whatever propellant I could find and write on the back of the house at nighttime when I let we had Dobermans, you know, we had Dobermans, we had bars on the one. It wasn't really to keep other people out. It was basically to control my whereabouts. But, you know, Whoa. anyway, there's, do there's dogs, you know, there's dogs. We got three Dobermans. So I let them out at nighttime in the backyard and got to clean up the shit. Mm -hmm. But I'm grabbing a can of Lysol and I'm bombing the back of the house just so you can see the wet stain. Wow. So when you're doing it every day, so... I found I used all the anything you could spray in a house, but I had a I found Easy Off Oven Cleaner, which of course it of course is the some of the first fat caps. Mm. So I discovered this can of Easy Off. So I started bombing in the back of the house in foam and like foam fat tips. So I'm catching wreck on it. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah. this looks good and it's white, it's not wet, and it's staying here. So it goes away like the next day and the next day after that, it rains. And when it rains, everywhere where I wrote with the easy off, it waterproofed it. And the tags were waterproof. So you could see the tags just as clear today because there wasn't a water model. Wow. I created a way of waterproofing tags, which I took out and, and started to rack easy off because sometimes it's easier to rack paint. And I would find places on concrete where you can kind of get that off at. Mm. So 
you know, I've had some success with that, but that's only because I, you know, it's turning dysfunction into function, basically. Yeah, and, and resourceful, being you know, like being resourceful as well. Mm-hmm. Right. But I did get my ass beat every single time it rained. <laughs> didn't go anywhere. It was there for years, basically. Every time it rained, you know, I could get kicked out of the house and have to go writing. So I had to keep stashes of the paint different places just so if I got kicked out and I couldn't, you know, I have to have some area where I put stuff in somebody's well of a basement and it's mm. in a plastic black bag oh, I had to do weird stuff like that in order just in case I get kicked out I at least have something wow. to to write with you know and then I lived in a two fare zone so I had to walk to the train it wasn't like I'd go walk around the corner and get on the train it wasn't that mm-hmm. I had to walk miles to get to the train to get on the train so I had to bomb sometimes my paint would run, paint would run out before I even got to the train wow because but then I got up on that street that I walked on. You know what I'm saying? So my whole graph experience was all trying to make sense of life itself. Mm-hmm. It was all completely ass backwards and different than damn near everyone else's. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is like, almost like possessed. You're possessed. But because of, but it wasn't. It was really trying to be calm, trying to not be like, I, you know, there was points in time where I, I literally could feel myself crack up, like you know, this is too much. Oh, I see. So kid. this, this, this kind of like this, this streamlines your, your, um, your anxieties and it channels it into it, it gives me something to do so I don't fucking lose it. Mm. It gives me a whole little curriculum of you. Your t- your hand style got to be nice. You got to have a throw up. Mm. You got to at least have some straight letter five color joints you mm. gotta at least have one one burner style that you can can do and then you gotta figure out a way to innovate within all of that so you can't just get up with your own name get up with some other names there's some point in time where i got up with names completely different than what i did just because when i got there i felt like it wasn't meant for me to write moon tns on the subway dude I had to write something else. So what did you write? Whatever came to mind. At, there's one point in time I wrote, I was, a, uh, you know, there was a point in time where there's a lot of five percenters in it. I wouldn't say it was kind of, it wasn't a gang, but it was kind of like a gang by the time it really proliferated. Right. So I became a five percenter and I was studying the lessons and I started writing Cypher, and I started writing Divine, and I started writing Understanding. So I was getting up with those names. So I, I, I go to the bus yard, and I'd write Cypher, Divine, Understanding. So each panel, I write something different <clears throat> from front to back. Wow. It was actually during this point in time where I was writing Divine and Cypher, and I was actually kind of starting to get it up. Like it was starting, you know, I was starting to turn it around and and at least be stable. That's the whole thing. Find a way to be stable so I can get up more. Mm. But I wasn't, you know, my house, I wasn't allowed to go out. Like my friends, the cat I got up most with, like Vega 5, that's my, was my main right. He can go and come out of his house, out the basement. He lived in the basement. He can walk out the basement door Anytime he want and go for and it as long as he wants, nobody and yeah. nobody's going to even say anything. It was mm-hmm. completely not like that with me. There be points in time they would go writing and they'd be like, "Man, if you don't come writing now, you're off the crew." Oh, that's just <laughs> low, bro. You know where you where you like, mm-hmm. oh man, these are my best friends and they're yeah. about to kick me out because I can't really get down with them. Wow. So, you know, Thanksgiving was a really big point holiday for, for writing graph because, the, you know, the transit workers is off. The old so just the, Yeah, everybody's chilling. It's Thanksgiving. So, yeah. you know, this one Thanksgiving is one of these points in time where I wasn't about to be in the crew no more that we formed because every time they went to the yard, I wasn't there. I'd be going to the yards by myself because I can't I can't find a way to get out when everybody else is getting out. Wow. So, so this one particular night, I'm trying to 
get out with them because they said they were going and I got to go. Mm. So, but I can't walk. Uh, I can't walk downstairs and walk out the door. I wouldn't get let back in or she'd even call the cops on me. Mm. So I had to, my house was covered into a, a tutor. It had an attic and a basement. So it was like a three-story house. I, you know, I was in a room on the second floor that had bars on the window. The windows below had bars on them. So I can't go down the steps. They creak. We got Dobermans. So I can't do Doberman. The dogs is going to make some. I can't do anything Ew. to sneak out of the house. Yeah, that's out, that's out of the question. So and then I got bars on the window, so I can't even get out or get back in. So I had to wow. devise a way of, of opening, you know, because the second bar, like especially if there's a bedroom, they have to have a way where you can open bars yeah, with a lock and key. Yeah. The, yeah. So so I I would in the middle of the night, my room was right next to her room. In the middle of the night, I opened the window like little by little, like it would take me five minutes to open the window. Just <laughs> The very slow creep. To very get the quiet. lock and then unlock the door, uh, unlock the, the lock and pull the lock out, push the window open. 40 open minutes later screen, and you're out the door. Open hey. the, exactly. <laughs> climb down, like and using all my stomach energy to climb down, put my mm. foot on the top of the bars, jump down into a rose garden, like a little rose bed, so get cut up with thorns. <laughs> then I got to hop over the fence to keep the dogs from running out and biting people, you got to hop over that. You got to do that really quietly. So I, I got to do all of this literally like 40 minutes later. Then I got to run basically to the yard, which is about maybe a mile away. So it's it's raining. It's kind of unseasonably cold. It just started. I, it's like drizzling. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, fuck, but I still got to go. Mm -hmm. So I go. I got, you know, I, I run the mile there basically. I get there. And then I got to climb over a huge fence to get into the the you know, it's basically a bus yard. It's mm -hmm. the, called the Merrick bus yard. Okay. So I'm thinking everybody's in there. So I'm over the fence and then I'm right, you know, I'm going through each bus, bus by bus. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting up. I'm getting up with Cypher, Divine, Understand. It's Cypher. I'm like, I'm killing it with this. So um, it was a, a point in time, you know, even colors like burgundy, like mixing black and red ink, like Flowmaster and Marsh, like black, black, Marsh ink and red flow master and making burgundy that was like that was divine within itself mm -hmm. so i had like a, a flooded you know i had cans and i had a flooded mark homemade with with burgundy ink and it had the perfect amount of drips and stuff so i'm in there killing it getting wow. up with divine under so i'm killing it i'm going through the cars so i go through the first row i'm in the second row and I get on a car and I'm bombing. I'm at the front of the bus. I'm going to the middle. And as I start to get to the back of the bus, there's someone sitting on the bus smoking a cigarette in the dark. It looked like a, it was basically a, a guy who worked at the bus depot taking a break on a bus, just wow. chilling. But he didn't say anything. Like I'm in the bus mashing this bus out. He didn't say a word. So I looked at him. I freeze. I drop everything. I shoot out the bus. It's in the second row. I shoot through the first row. I climb this fence that got little, it's like a little uh, uh, weaving of the thing. It's not the big one you can put your toes in. It's like little. I scurry up this gate. I stand on the top of it. I'm about to jump off. I oh. slip off and I land on these uh pylons of their cement pylons they're at the front of the gate so when the bus comes in he doesn't hit the gate i know exactly the ones you it's mean. a little pylon right it's yeah. a little small pylon i slip off of this high fence and land straddled on the <gasps> cement pylon and obliterated my nuts this like one nut i can't even feel it's pouring raining I run across, it's Merrick Boulevard, I run across Merrick Boulevard, I pass out unconscious. These cats never even came to the yard that night. Oh, so I'm like doing all geez. of this for night. It's unseasonably cold, it's raining. Now I, I wake up from being unconscious and I got to walk a mile home and I can't even walk. Like all for not trying to get kicked out of a crew. So I, I'm literally like Quasimodo 
yeah. hobbling a mile to the to in the in the rainy streets. Then I have to repeat the whole process of getting in the house, getting back in. So now, right? But I got to do it extra quiet. So I got to climb the fence to hop over it without making noise to alert the Dobermans. All while my whole core energy, my nuts, everything is squashed. Mm. I can't, I can't imagine trying to climb a gate and not even use your, your stomach. Yeah, forget it. So I climbed the gate. I don't know how I got over it, but I got over it. Now I have to climb the bars on the first floor so I can reach up to the second floor to pull myself in. Yeah. When my core energy is shot. And I got to do it quiet, and it's taken like a half an hour to do this whole thing quietly, right when I'm literally in the worst pain I've ever been in my life. So that's the type of weird, dumb shit I went through with writing that, you know, can never happen at any point in time <laughs> in life. Yeah, they you always know, say, you know, do all those sorts of things when you're young, but I don't think you'd even you want that do, when you're young. Exa exactly. It's what you do to try to be down. So I was trying to be down. I was trying to innovate. I was trying to do whatever I can in the most functional manner possible, but I wasn't nearly as dope as cats who couldn't eat. You know, all they had to do basically is get down and practice and, you know, I, I couldn't do it that way. Everything of my way was trying to do it in the most sane way possible under the most fucked up condition. Yeah, in the most insane situations. Right. To the point where I couldn't, I was still out the house. I'm still sleeping on the trains, but I can't even write no more. That's when I discovered, to me, the most up person in all of New York City, possibly in history, was pray is the, the old lady who wrote the scratch the scratch tags was up more than anybody else and I saw pray since I was a little kid mm. so she's been up since I was a little kid she's been in every of the old fashioned telephone booths where you go in and put a quarter in there's pray on them shits ever since like three four five six seven eight. Ever since they got rid of the phones, there was prayer. Every subway girder in, in New York City had a prey on it, scratched wow. in it. Every every store gate, damn near on every block, including the projects, the little metal uh, things that hold the iron gates going up, they're brown in the air. Like everybody's like uniform. There was a prey scratched in every single one of those, even in the worst projects. Wow. All in all in two fare zones, all in streets where you had to walk, where you're not even on a bus route, where you're just walking and mm. it's the neighborhood phone. Like, and this is supposed to be like an older white lady. Wow. who have been doing it, up. doing it up to the sixties. So that's when I discovered, cause I couldn't write no more. Trey was up more than anybody. Yeah. By that's far, fine. by far. It's, I find it. I find it interesting that the the perception of of writers sometimes the ones that are up the most you you actually it's not you turn a it's not you turn a blind eye but you just it, it, you inherit you think that they're just always going to be there it's always inherent that they're of course they're there you you don't really consider to what extent the extremity of that it's just a given isn't it it's, that's mad it's well you know once again you got to go back to the first time people did it to the time where there's been three or four people who had a blueprint mm. for newer cats to come along and get up and, you know, the Josses and, the, you know, rest in peace, like all the cats who, mm. who've been up on all the gates now, mm. they've had blueprints of how to do that at least three or four times. Mm. So the generations, it, it seems, yeah. Yeah. So it seems like it's a given. But all them cats who, you know, hats off to them, and that's saturation, Bob, and that's going at it night after night after night after night. And that's yeah. what Prey was doing in the, you know, the 60s. But the, 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 the risk gets up. higher, though. The risk it's, gets it's higher. Crazy. The more you do it, the, the, the higher oh, risk. If you... The higher risk, without a doubt, without a doubt. So, you, you know, 
hopefully at some point in time, that's, you know, that's the point of coming up in a bombing. It was like bombing and style, bombing and style. You got to have an equal amount of both because if you bomb too much, like, you know, you, you literally become delinquent with it. Mm-hmm. Like you have to become delinquent with it. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah. to come to a point where it's retarded, stupid. I'm, I'm retarded up. That's how much <laughs> up I'm at. Right. It's retarded <laughs> how up I am. You're bound to get caught at some point in time. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully you graduate, you pick up other styles and us other disciplines yeah. and you turn this whole thing that you did as a child to love to continue to do it basically all your life. And you're still doing what you love because it's what you've done your whole entire life, what you learn how to do your whole entire life. So look, to keep on some... doing it out of love. Yeah, because you and love is, is key because there's many uh graffiti artists and many that have been on the podcast that um that uh found a sort I guess a sense of resentment that when they got caught, it's the you know the thing they love it's completely brutalized them and had them incarcerated or going through emotionally things that perhaps you know run in tandem with things that were going on in their life and graffiti. It's 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 hard to I guess when when you get get to that over that threshold to to still retain the love the love for it yeah if if you grow with it you 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 can do that you know i was it's you know we're all in a fishbowl and stuff when we're at like, you know you're a kid but you know as you get to a point where you you know that's why even in the earlier years, a lot of writers stopped at 16 because at some point in time, what you're doing is child's play because it wasn't invented before. So you're inventing, you're innovating it, but you're innovating something that's kind of childish at first. Mm. Then as the more it gets on, the more harder it gets because, you know, people are looking out for it. So, yeah. that, you know, you're still trying to be innovative and doing something that's already been done. Hopefully you learn from that and you graduated and you, and you go into another form mm-hmm. of the culture. Mm. And hopefully that's what saves you, you know, and if, you know, you live, you're in that fishbowl that you live in, but maybe, you know, be, once again, because of my circumstances, I moved around a lot. I was in a lot of different, I lived a lot of places. Mm. So, you know, I was able to to write the routes in Philadelphia. So I got up to cat Dice Raw, who's with the roots and stuff. So even before all that, me and Dice Raw is getting up, as they say, running the routes in Philly. Yo, I, I hit, yo, are you for real? I, I That's freight, incredible, I hit, bro. I hit freights everywhere I lived. Somehow I, I moved somewhere close to a freight layup. So everywhere I lived, I wrote. You know, and I did it to the extent of what I wanted to do while I was there. I lived yeah. in St. Louis at one point in time. I calculated it took me maybe two weeks to get up to the point where I'm quote unquote all city St. Louis. Wow. So, you know, at that point in time, it's all child's play, but you do it to the extent of not getting caught and getting your name up and, and getting to the point where, you know, where you want to see the fame mm. from it. You know, so th- these were the things I was doing before the music really kind of took off. I was still getting down with what I'm with what I'm doing because it's still a discipline to me. I still got to practice it. Mm. It's not going to just come. Your hand style isn't just always going to be there. You got to kind of practice it. Yeah, keep the keep the sword sharp. Exactly. You know, and sometimes I don't even, once again, don't get up in my own name in St. Louis. I got up with, with my government name just because there was a cat in Harlem who wrote Justin. And I, you know, I was kind of envious of that when I was younger. I was like, damn, that's kind of dope. He's writing yeah. my name and shit. So when I went to St. Louis, I didn't write Moon T and S or wrote Justin. Just because I wanted to get those letters off. Wow. And it took me like two weeks to, you know, get to the point where I hit all the highways. I hit all the significant avenues. I hit all of the areas in front of clubs. I hit all of the areas where it seemed like it mattered. You know, to, mm. to say like, you know, when you turn your head, man, who's Justin? This motherfucker's up. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. I go, I go riding on tour, you know, I hit freights on tour. I hit the streets and shit on tour. So, you know, I literally wrote everywhere I went around the world. I literally wrote. I'll still write if I can feel like I can get away with it. So it's like I never stop. 
but I'm not dumb with it at this like once again at this point in time it's just a discipline so you you whether you whether you're in Europe or UK or um, the US North America Canada you you would actively sort out to find the 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 quickest exit plan from the venue to go and bomb if I'm not just leaving the venue and going three or four blocks from the venue and, and, and making little squares around the venue. Like I'll get up around an area at least where at, at the very least that I wouldn't necessarily a lot of times go with a bunch of people. I've been invited hundreds of times to go riding with cats that I don't know their, I don't know their reputation. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Be like I'm, I don't know how hot the yard is. I know nothing about you or nothing. You want me to go to the yards and get that shit sounds wonderful, but nah, I'm going to pass on that one. I think when it comes to um, the legacy of company flow, I mean, aside from the obvious um, that the, 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 um, the all three of you bring, the, the legacy that I feel that company flow holds more than anything is the honoring of graffiti as, as, as a genre and actually having real real in-depth uh songs uh constructive lyrics that really transfer onto record that you're actually you you're visualizing shit you know end to end burners man it's you know that song alone is like i I was an mc who was a writer Mm. double meaning right i'm literally an mc who was a writer who's still a writer I'm a different writer now, but I'm still a writer. The same, the same discipline applies. The same rules applies. It's just a different form of writing. I'm still bombing, but I'm letter bombing now. I'm sound bombing. Yeah. It's the same principle, right? Basically. So yeah, company flow was, was literally like, how do you do it? You know, I took to me, I felt like my contribution to it was taking the same aspects of what how you would do with the writing culture and apply it to music so you you know you you got to analyze the landscape so you got to scope out the yard right so you're scoping out the yard you're seeing who's up who's really dope mm. you're seeing who's toy right yeah 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 you're, you're so, everything. so you're scoping everything out and you're trying to see okay cats ain't really getting up like this let me go to this yard mm. and sneak in here and smash it this particular way so it stands out. And to me, that's what I felt like what was happening. I scoped out basically the MCs in the landscape and the production level and who was doing what, mm. finding out who was dopest, and then basically putting words together where I'm sound bombing, mm-hmm. where I'm literally doing what, so they're writing rhymes. I'm literally trying to sound bomb them. So I'm trying yeah. to out bomb them in a way that also still has style. Because that's where I came from. I came from the saturation bombing and the style. I, I, I'm a mixture of both of them. Mm. They don't get along, but you got to find a way for them to get along. And through the other writing aspect of it, the putting words and wordsmithing together, mm. saturation bombing and stacking words and having a style about you really do can they go hand in hand. You guys had... Um... Yeah, this is where I can really get my fanboy going, Chris. Uh, you lyrically, you was sound bombing, it still is. Um, that the the weight twelve inch that you did, did just your verses on that, you, you, you visualizing shit like you were doing it. But God, dare I say it? I mean, quote me if I'm wrong. Like Doctor Octagon came through, but n- but but not the world was not ready for you and Company Flow. And the way that you guys attacked the dictionary, you just went fucking ham and, and, and nothing. It, it almost like set precedence. It set precedence yeah, no to doubt. a whole, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, well, first of all, shout outs to Cool Keith because Cool Keith set precedence in that style way before I, you know, I, I bought the, you the bought the Ultra Magnetic. I bought Ultra Magnetic tape the day it came out on Jamaica Avenue. I bought that shit the day it came out. Mm -hmm. So I was up on Ultra Mag, but so Cool Keith was doing it way before we were. So to me, he's a kind of a father 
of that style, but it's not about style jacking. It's about how you, you know, so he had a particular style. We literally were trying to stack words and then L was, you know, like a Philip K. Dick lover. So, you know, so that, that brings in some of the, uh, the anarchist cookbook. And then when you start mixing the two together, then you really get some shit that, that is, you know, with obscure references that are just really hitting it, like naturally hitting it from different levels that Mm -hmm. nobody's done it before because it just, you got to be two complete different individuals to, to pair them two together, basically. Yeah, you've got to be two worlds parallel that kind of suddenly, that's what creates the friction. Exactly, exactly. But Cool Keith was murdering it before we were born. Cool Keith was doing it when I wasn't even an MC. So I, I never thought I would be, I never thought, I, I actually did production before MC because mm. I'm, a, I'm a cat who don't like to talk. So I don't like to sit here and do what we're doing now. It's fun, but in general, you know, it's not something I, I kind of like to do. So MCs, when I came up with cats who were able to go off the top of the head and, you know, just go for fucking hours and just say, you know, dope things that rhyme together. And like, I never wanted to do that. Mm. I've always been a writer. Mm. So I had to wait till my writing caught up with my other writing. And that's how I was able to kind of bridge that gap. I always knew that this was going to be an important podcast. Um, I I mean, listen, on the real, uh, fan first, I think I must have spent at least three years tracing you, finding you. And then I can't even remember, I can't remember who I even, I even tapped up. And because I knew you'd done one podcast before, and I'm like, yo, there's some undocumented information that needs to be sourced, needs to be just as the man that has this information, and you are delivering. Why, why, why so, um, what the anonymity that you hold? Because you're not, like you say, you're not a social cat, you're not online, you don't mess like that. What what why is that? Hmm. I don't know. It's like a good question. Um, I think really because you know everything I was striving for where when I was younger, you know, especially doing writing, which is what most of us are doing it for. We're striving for the fame, right? Mm. We really want to get up. We we want to get up because we want people to acknowledge it. But we're really kids doing it. It's really the first thing you can do as a child, or at least in my generation. I don't know what kids were doing before then to become someone. But you literally can become someone and do it out of nothing during the generation I came up in. Mm -hmm. And it was all about going out for the fame. So if you've done that since you were little, by the time you get to the point, it's almost like some people are complete nerds because they weren't cool in high school. So you get to a certain point mm-hmm. where it's like, nigga, I've been cool. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm not chasing being cool or being fame now. I just, I'm already that. So you become anti that. Mm-hmm. So to me, I'm anti that. I'm not trying to chase fame or anything. I would like for cats to know what's going on. I'm still, you know, that's why I'm still doing stuff. You know, but I want you to kind of search for it in a little bit. Like I'm yeah, out yeah, here, yeah. but I'm not. I'm not about to do something stupid so I can be famous. We don't even live in that type of era no more. Shit no, ain't no. even about that no more. Everybody thinks it's about that, but that's really no. what it is, right? You um, really com- not about that. Yourself, LP, um, Mr. Lend, Company Flow. Um, you, you're, you know, the indelible MCs. You know, you guys are the antithesis of. Um, you know, you were the opposite to the shiny suit era. So I get, I completely understand where you're coming from. It would go, but it would go against your moral principles <laughs> if you if you got along to get, you know, assimilated, right? Exactly, and to make some music that somebody else is trying to make, to make some shit that sounds like, you know, you know what it's like still to this day trying to make shit different. Mm. 
it's, you know, so you can't, you know, I can't be as prolific because I'm trying to do, I'm still trying to do stuff that nobody's doing because that's how I came up. I'm not biting nobody's style. Okay. I, guess, I mean, cats, cats bite my style, but I'm not going to come out here and bite somebody's style. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to, if I have to create new genres, I'm going to get off something that nobody's doing. So, you know, that's what I spend my days doing. I treat music just like you had all these disciplines in writing that you had to, as I do the same thing. I apply that with Prince, who had seven different little styles of, of mm. tunes. Like, where they were, you know, I'm like, well, I need seven, I need eight, nine different styles of music that nobody is doing, you know, and then it takes yeah. time to start building and stockpiling that up. But that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing now. And they all slowly are now starting to kind of come out and unfold, you know? So that's you a know, beautiful, uh, beautiful position. Yeah. So this please, you know, look for me, but I'm, I'm not going to be out there being monitored like that. Nah, nah. And we you don't want you to be, we don't want you to be neither just like, exactly. Yo, you know, the crazy thing is, is that, um, I mean, nothing actually, you know, while I think about it, heavy is the crown on the head. That's quite a, a pressure that um, that you have to bear. So far as I mean, it's like a like a scientist, like you're going deep into the uh, recesses of, uh, of 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 creativity. You know what I mean, you're an artisan of, of sorts. You know what I mean? That's a that's a that's a real study. That that must get quite claustrophobic. Well. You got to do multiple things. You can't do one particular thing and feel like you pigeonhole yourself in some particular area. You also are responsible for telling the truth, you know. And there's a lot of stuff post com even company flow, but company flow and post company flow is really documenting the situation, documenting the history, and making sure you're trying to be on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. So all of my nephilim modulation stuff and all of our solo stuff, I've done that. I've mm -hmm. done after that. It's literally been trying to find a way to make sure I cover all of the bases, but I also am documenting time that I, I come from and that I live in. And I'm doing it in a correct manner, and whether I'm on the right side of the fence or wrong. I'm always on the right side of the fence, I know, but mm -hmm. it may not be on the right side of the fence to, to everyone else. Historically so, correct. Historically, historically even up to this day. So even up you even up to Palestine, mm. what side of the fence you're on? It is really only one side that's correct. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know. 100%. But yeah, you know, there's like it's hard. It's you know, it's hard for me to get into England sometimes. You know mm. what I'm saying? I feel like, you know, I've been on some type of a list list because I've said some outlandish shit. Of course, I dread to think <laughs> what know? my I dread to think what my <laughs> algorithms say about my, my yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so you know if motherfuckers could hold you down for yeah. a little bit they didn't check you out yeah yeah so i feel like i'm already excessively being checked out in certain places so i ain't trying to fucking hold the yeah. flames of my hand like that <laughs> no, no okay. reason to do that shit <laughs> yeah dude uh, heavy. again heavy as the crown <laughs> mm -hmm. um the critical question is um Actually, a few more, a few more. Um, why, why Chicago at the moment? Oh, uh, I have a, I have a son here, and my girl is here. Beautiful. My girl, who I've been from here for a while, and it's funny. I never Chicago is never a city I wanted to be in. I've you know I've lived in Atlanta, I've lived in San Diego, I've lived in L.A., I've lived in. St. Louis, I spent, and then I spent time, Miami, Portland, like I've spent long periods of time, you know, in other different places, like four or five different places in LA. Mm. And Chicago was really no place I never wanted to live ever mm. in life. Cause to me, it was kind of like a junior city to New York. Mm -hmm. So if you already live in the biggest city, you know, but then you look at New York, at some point in time, you want to graduate from New York because it's not all what it's cracked up to. It's too hard of living. It's too mm. expensive for what it is. So 
as supreme mathematics. You got to do the number and try to make the the numbers make sense no matter where you're at. Yeah. And this country is slowly pricing itself out of out of where people can live. Can you live know, you, right. so yeah. it's it's kind of kooky, but uh, yeah, you know, my son liked the school. You know, he liked his college here, and um, I was already kind of talking to a girl here, and it, it just. It's like, well, let me give it a shot for a little bit just because I haven't lived here. And, you know, now I've been here for a couple of years, then it's dope. You know, the people of Chicago is dope. Like the the scene, the music scene, and, you know, the trap Mm -hmm. shit Mm -hmm. is really fucked up in the way Cass has really been murdering each, you know, each other Mm -hmm. over it. You know, it's it's insane. But once again, it does bring different things out. There's more that that's going on. You know, there's a whole juke scene and you know, there's the whole, you know, Chicago tech. There's a whole that's other right. different types of music here that I've completely fell in love with. That's, you know, yeah. helps me make new music. So everywhere I go, I'm trying to immerse myself in the culture and step the game up. So I do that wherever I'm at. You know, so um, I just you know, happen to do it in Chicago at the moment. Um, so. When 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 I say uh, the future of company flow, I'm not suggesting you 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 must write an album and appease us uh, super fans. But when I say the future of company flow, how does that sit with you? Um, look, I've always been the cat that's saying I'm cool with it, and we need to do something because you need to you need to confirm that it wasn't a fluke. You know what I'm okay. saying? You need, yeah, you yeah, need I do to, know. you need, a, you need it in the inverter. You have to do it. So i have always been the cat saying that. So you know, we got different feelings. We, you know, we're different. We were at. It doesn't matter because we're closer in age now. But you know, at some point in time, you know, we were on different wavelengths. Mm-hmm. We were on different paths and trajectories in what we think we were in a career. Mm-hmm. So, you know what I'm saying? I was, when I was doing co-flow with them, I felt like I've been, I had a whole lifetime of b-boyism before I even rapped. Mm -hmm. So it was a whole different thing for me as it was for them. Because they were just getting off the ground and just getting their acknowledgement. I've had, you know, I've crushed my nuts for my... (laughs) Yeah. You know what I'm saying? For my problem. <laughs> well, what do you basically. want from me? <laughs> what do you want, you know, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, just different, I guess, um, different, uh, like you say, create, creative mindsets. But, um, uh, yeah, you, 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 um, you checked out the party and there's no good reason why you can't jump back in, you know, your thrones are, are waiting kind of thing. Um, my music hasn't gone anywhere. I, you know, I haven't been signed to labels where I felt like I've been fucked over and, Mm. you know, you have a bunch of people telling you your snares are not hitting, you know what I'm saying? Your mix down is fucked up or, you know, you're not, you're, you're, you're too old to be doing what you're doing. And I have never had any of that issue. Mm -hmm. I've always made music because I wanted to make music. So I don't have, I don't feel like I have anything stopping me, but I do feel if I have something to say, I'm going to put the shit out. Hell and if yeah. I'm going to, you know, I still, fun crushing is still fun crushing. Mm-hmm. I'm still trying to fun crush, you know? So as long as I'm looking at it, like I'm trying to fun crush, I'm putting stuff out. Because yeah. I'm, because basically I'm listening to what you're doing. And I'm like, man, that's not it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you're not bust. You're not busting that right. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to get on that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and it's the thing. That's what keeps it competitive, doesn't it? it? Keeps you driven. I'm. You know, I have to say at this point in time, I don't even look at competition because our cats are doing shit for different reasons. Mm. You know, and once again, it's weird because of uh, you know, because of Lil Wayne, because of Jay Z, and you know, people aren't really writing no more. They're like, they look at writing is whack, but writing is the most important thing in all of music, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the hardest thing to do. That's harder than production, yeah. you know, and like cats are just, you know, kind of 
wilding out, taking shit, and just sing song in their way that way. You couldn't even do that when I was coming no, up. No, no. They'd fucking slap you out the booth. Like, yeah, what are you both, doing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, so, you know, I feel like there's not a competition in terms of people are not really focused on what they're trying to say. Mm-hmm. You just get, you know, the generational gap seems like it gets smaller and smaller. Because mm-hmm. the cats are not saying anything and it's not really making that much sense. So they uh-huh. come out and they trying to be too hard and too gangster. And, you know, like you based in Chicago, man, you, your ass may be dead by the end of the year with, with one or two hot songs. Because you done wow. said so much in them songs that really you're not supposed to say when you could have been said something else to uplift the people. But you, you know, mm, you're not themselves. doing that. You, you're smoking on fucking ops and shit so you you know what i'm saying you're dead before the end of the year so wow. there's nothing to compete in terms of it that way the younger people are just really emotionally it's another form of abuse yeah yeah. you yeah, know great. and they have to manage their abuse basically like i had to imagine i had to manage mine yeah you know i didn't want to look at it in that type of way but like i say when you're coming up here it's not like you're on top of shit you're not um, that's right it's Are you it's... rarely on top of shit? People fucking go out not on top of shit. Mm. Perpetuates, doesn't it? It and shouldn't. It shouldn't, but, you know, mm. when you're being kept in the dark, you know what I'm saying? When you're mm. purposely being kept in the dark on everything in life, how do you expect to grow? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Well, flowers don't grow that way, neither do no. humans. Exactly. Oh. Well, on that note, because um, I I have to say, just this, <laughs> and I I I I have never said this before, but you're in the bucket list, man. And if someone said to me, "You ain't doing no more podcasts anymore," the fact that I've had this one done, man, and the fact that this was way more of a conversation than I could ever, you know, to have been patient and managed to get you on. It was worth every fucking minute, my brother. And I really, honestly, that was an amazing conversation. If someone said to me, you ended the podcast for the years, for the years ahead, I'd be like, that's cool. I've got just. <laughs> bless, bless. It's the highest yeah, it's been cool, I can man. give you. It's been cool. I'm glad we had a chance to chop it up. Yeah. Yeah. And gracious have you been on the journey up towards this, man. I honestly value and appreciate you, my brother. Thank you so much. Bless, bless. Killer Keller podcast. That lighting was out of fashion. I'm going to go and find a cold bucket somewhere and really calm myself down. Um, Big shout out to everybody that checked in. And uh, yeah, remember, crime don't pay, but neither do they. Ask Big Joss, all right? Killer Keller podcast. That lighting was out of fashion, all right? You stay lucky, people. Peace. Yo, that was incredible. (laughs) 